Chapter 11 Negros fingered the demon's soul, trying to decide his next move. The orc commander had been unable to sleep most of the night. Torgos's failure to return from his mission, eating at the thoughts of the elder warrior. Had he failed? Had both dragons perished? If so, what sort of force did that mean the humans had sent to rescue Alexstrasza? An army of griffin riders with wizards in tow? Surely even the Alliance could not afford to send such might, not with a war to the north and their own internal squabbles. He had tried to contact Zulid with his concerns, but the shaman had not responded to his magical missive. The orc knew what that meant. With matters already so dire elsewhere, Sulhead had no time for what likely seemed to him his subordinate's fanciful fears. The shaman expected Necros to act as any orc warrior should, with decisiveness and assurance, which left the maimed warrior, the maimed officer, back at square one. The demon soul gave him great power to command, but Necros knew that he did not understand even a fraction of its potential. In fact, understanding the depths of his ignorance made the orc uncertain as to whether he had dared even to try to use the artifact for more than he already had. Zulahed still did not realize what he had passed to his subordinate. From what little Necros had discovered on, its own, on his own, the demon soul contained such restless, such relentless power, wielded with skill, it could likely wipe out the entire alliance force the orc officer knew to be massing near the northern gates of Cosmodon. The trouble was, if wielded carelessly, the disc could also obliterate all of Grimpatal. Give me a good axe and two working legs and I'll throw you into the nearest volcano, he muttered at the golden artifact. At that moment, a harried-looking warrior barged into his quarters, ignoring his commander's sudden glare. Torcus returns! Good news at last. The commander exhaled in relief. If Torcus had returned, then at least one threat had been eradicated after all. Necros fairly leapt from his bench. Hopefully, Torcus had been able to take at least one prisoner. Sulahed would expect it. A little torture, and the whining human would no doubt tell them everything they needed to know the upcoming invasion to the north. At last, how far? A few minutes, no more. The other orc had anxious expression on his ugly face, but Necros ignored it for the moment, eager to welcome back the mighty dragon rider. At least Torgus had not let him down. He put away the demon soul and hurried as fast as he could to the vast cavern the dragon riders used for landings and takeoffs. The warrior who had brought word followed close behind, curiously silent. Necros, however, welcomed the silence this time. The only voice he wanted to hear was that of Torgus, relating his great victory over the outsiders. Several other orcs, including most of the surviving riders, already awaited Torgus at the wide mouth of the cavern. Necros frowned at the lack of order but knew that, like him, they eagerly awaited the champion's triumphant arrival. Make way! Make way! Pushing past the rest, he started out into the faint light of pre-dawn. At first, he could not spot either Leviathan, the sentry, who had noted their imminent and arrival surely had to have sharpest eyes of any orc. Then, then gradually, Nekla... Necros noted a dark form in the distance, one that swelled in size as it neared. Only one. The peg-leg orc grunted. Another great loss, but one he could live with now that the threat had been vanquished. Necros could not tell which dragon returned, but, like the others, he expected to be Torgus's mount. No one could defeat Grim Batal's greatest champion. And yet, and yet. As the dragon coalesced into divine shape, Necros noticed that it flew in ragged fashion, that its wings looked torn, and the tail hung practically limp. 
Squinting, he saw that a rider did indeed guide the beast, but that the rider sat half slumped in the saddle, as if barely conscious. An uncomfortable tingle ran up and down the commander's spine. Clear away, he shouted. Clear away. He'll need lots of room to land. In truth, as Necro stumped away, he realized that Torgus's mount would nearly need all the free room in the vast chamber. The closer the dragon got, the more erratic flight pattern revealed itself. For one brief moment, Necros even thought that the Leviathan might crash into the side of the mountain. So badly did he maneuver. Only at last, perhaps urged by his handler, did the crimson monster manage to enter. With a crash, the dragon landed amongst them. Orcs shouted in surprise and consternation, consternation as the wounded beast did slip, beast slip forward, unable to halt his momentum. One warrior went flying as a wing clipped him. The tail swung to and fro, battering the walls and bringing down chunks of rock from the ceiling. Necros planted himself against one wall and gritted his teeth. Dust rose everywhere. A silence suddenly filled the chamber, a silence during which the maimed officer and those who had managed to get out of the dragon's path began to realize that the gargantuan creature before them had made it back to the roost, only to die. Not so, however, the rider. A figure arose in the dust, a teetering yet impressive form that unlashed itself from the giant corpse and slid down the backside, nearly falling to his knees when he touched the floor. He spat blood and dirt from his mouth, and then peered around the best as he could, searching, searching for Necros. We're lost, bellowed the bravest, the strongest of the dragon riders. We're lost, Necros. Torgus's arrogance had now grown, been tempered by something else, something that his commander blatantly recognized as resignation. Torgus, who had always shown, sworn to go down fighting, now looked so very defeated. No, not him. The older orc hobbed over to his champion as quickly as he could, his expression darkening. Silence! I'll have none of that talk. You shame the clans. You shame yourself. Torgus leaned as best as he could against the remains of his mount. Shame? I've no shame, old one. I've only seen the truth. And the truth is that we've no hope now. Not here. Ignoring the fact that the other orcs stood taller and outweighed him, Necros took hold of the rider by the shoulder and shook him. Speak. What makes you spout such treason? Look at me, Necros. Look at my mount. You know what did this? You know what we fought? An armada of griffins? A legion of wizards? Bloodstains covered the once magnificent honors still pinned to Torgus's chest. The dragon rider tried to laugh, but got caught coughing in a coughing fit. Necros impatiently waited. Would, would have been a fair fight if I say so. Now, we saw only a handful of griffins. Probably bait. Have to be. Too small for any useful force. Never mind that. What did this to you? What did this? Torgus looked past his commander, eyeing his fellow warriors. Death itself. Death in the form of a black dragon. Consternation broke out among the orcs. Necros himself stiffened at the words. Deathwing? And fighting for the humans. Came from the clouds just as I tried for one of the griffins. We barely escaped. It could not be, and yet... It had to be. Torgus would not have made up such a bold lie. If he had, if he said that Deathwing had done this, and certainly by the rips and tears that decorated the giant corpse added much credence to his word, then Deathwing had done this. Tell me more. Leave out no detail. Despite his own condition, the writer did just that, telling how he and the other orc had come upon the seemingly insignificant band Scouts, perhaps. Torgus had seen several dwarfs, an elf, and at least one wizard. Simple pickings, save for the unexpected sacrifice of a human warrior who had somehow single-handedly slain the other dragon. Even then, Torgus had expected little more trouble. The wizard had proved some annoyance, 
but had vanished in the midst of combat, likely having fallen to his death. The orc had moved in on the party, ready to finish them. That had been the Deathwing. That had been when Deathwing had attacked. He had made simple work of Torgus's own beast, who had initially refused his handler's instructions and sought and had sought battle. No coward, Torgus had nonetheless immediately known the futility of battling the armored behemoth. Over and over during the struggle, he had shouted for his own, for his mount to turn away. Only when the red dragon's wounds had proven too much, he had, the beast had finally obeyed and fled. As the story unfolded, Necros saw all of his worst nightmares coming true. The goblin, Creel, had been correct in informing him that the Alliance sought to wrest the Dragon Queen from Orc control, but the foul little creature had either not known or had not bothered to tell his master about the forces amassed for that quest. Somehow, the humans had managed the unthinkable. A pact was the only creature both sides respected and feared. Deathwing, he muttered. Yet why would they waste the armor behemoth on such a mission? Surely Targus had it right when he said that the band he had discovered had to be scouts or bait. Surely such, surely a much faster force followed close behind. And suddenly it came to Necros what was unfolding. He turned to face the other orcs, fighting to keep his voice from cracking. The invasion's begun, but that's not it. The invasion's begun, but the Norse not it. The humans and their allies are coming for us first. His warriors glanced at one another in dismay, clearly realizing that they had faced more threat in any than the Horde could have imagined. It was one thing to die violently in battle, another to no one face certain slaughter. His conclusions made perfect sense to Necros. Move in unexpectedly from the west, seize the southern portion of Cosmodon, free or slay the Dragon Queen, leaving the remnants of the Horde in the north near D Dun Algaz, Burfit of their chief support, then move up from Girm Batal, caught between the attackers from the south and those coming from Dunmortar. The last hopes of the orc race would be crushed, the survivors sent to the guarding enclaves set by humans. Zulu had left him in charge of all matters concerning the mountain and the captive dragons. The shaman had not seen fit to respond, therefore he assumed he would trust Necros to do what he must. Very well then, Necros would do just that. Torgus, get yourself patched up and get some sleep. I'll be needing you later. Necros, obey! The fury in his eyes made even the champion back down. Torgus nodded, and with the aid of a com comrade, modeled off, moved off. Necros turned his attention back to the others. Gather whatever is most important and get into the wagons. Move all the eggs and crates padded with hay and keep them warm. He paused, going down a mental list. Be prepared to slay any dragon whelps still too wild to train properly. This made Torgus pause. He and the other riders eyed their commander with horror. Slay the whelps? We need, we need whatever we can be moved quickly, just in case. The taller orc eyed him. In case of what? In case I don't manage to take care of Deathwing. Now he had everyone staring at him, as if he had sprouted a second head and turned into an orc. Take care of Deathwing, grabbed one of the other riders. Necro searched for his chief wrangler. The orc aided him in most dealing with the dragon queen. You, come with me. You need to figure out how to move the mother. Torgus finally thought he knew what he was going on. You're abandoning Grimbatal? You're taking everything north to the lines? Yes, they'll, fo they'll just follow. Deathwing will follow. The pegleg orc snorted. You've, your orders, or am I surrounded now by whining peons? You've your orders. Or am I surrounded by whining peons instead of mighty warriors? The barb struck. Torgus and the others straightened. Necros might be maimed, but he still commanded. They could not do anything but obey, regardless of how mad they thought his plans. 
He pushed past the injured champion, past all in his path, mind already racing. Yes, it would be essential to have the Dragon Queen out in the open. Only, if only at the mouth of this very cavern that would serve him best. He would do as the humans had done, set the bait. Although, just in case he failed, the eggs, at least, had to reach Zulu head. Even if they only survived, it would be it would aid the horde. And if Necros could achieve victory, no matter if it cost him his life, then the orc still had a chance. One beefy hand slipped to the pouch where the demon soul rested. Necros Skull Crusher had wondered about the limitations of the mysterious talesman. Now he would have a chance to find out. The dim light stirred Ronan from what seemed one of the deepest slumbers he had ever experienced. With effort, the wizard pushed himself up and looked around, trying to get his bearings. A wooded area, not the end of which he had been dreaming, not the end where he and Verisa had been sitting, speaking of. You are awake. Good. The words arose within his mind without any warning, nearly sending him to, into shock. Ronan leapt to his feet spinning around in a circle before he finally realized the source. He clutched the small medallion dangling around his throat, the one he had been given to him the night before by Deathwing. A faint glow emanated from the smoky black crystal in the center, and as Ronan stared at it, he recalled the entire night's events, including the promise the great Leviathan had made. I will be there to guide you the entire way, the dragon had said. Where are you? the mage finally asked. Elsewhere, replied Deathwing. But I am also with you. The thought made Ronan shudder, and he wondered why he had finally agreed to the dragon's offer, likely because he had not had any choice. What happens now? The sun rises. You must be on your way. Peering around, the weary mage eyed the landscape toward the east. The woods gave way to a rocky and hospitable area that he knew from maps would eventually guide him to Grimbatal and the mountain where the orcs kept the Dragon Queen. Roland estimated that Deathwing had saved him several days' journey by bringing him this far. Grimbatal had to be only two or three days away, providing Roland pushed hard. He stared off in the obvious direction, only to have Deathwing immediately interrupt him. That is not the way you should go. Why not? It leads directly to the mountain. And into the claws of the orcs, human. Are you such a fool? Ronan bridled at the insult, but kept his silent kept silent his retort. Instead he asked, Then where? See. And in the human's mind, flashed the image of his present surroundings. Ronan barely had time to digest the astonishing vision before it began moving. First slowly, then with greater and greater swiftness, the vision moved along a particular path, racing through the woods and into the rocky regions. From there, it twisted and turned, the images continuing to speed up at a dizzy rate. Cliffs and gullies darted by trees passed in a blur. Ronan had to hold on to the nearest trunk in order not to be swept away by the sights within his mind. Hills grew higher, more menacing, at last becoming the first mountains. Even then, the vision did not slow. Not until it suddenly fixed on one peak in particular. One which drew the wizard despite his hesitations. At the base of that peak... Ronan's view shifted skyward with such abruptness that he nearly lost all sense of equilibrium. The vision climbed the great peak, always showing areas that the wizard realized contained ledge or handholds. Up and up it went, until at least it reached a narrow cave mouth, and ended as abruptly as it began, leaving a shaken Ronan once more standing amidst the foliage. There is the path the only path that will enable you to achieve your goal. 
but that route will take longer and go through more precarious regions. He did not even want to think of climbing that mountainside. What seemed a simple route for a dragon looked most treacherous to a human, even when gifted with the power of magic. You will be aided. I will not say you would have to walk the entire way, but it's the first time for you it is time for you to begin, the voice insisted. Ronan started walking, or rather, Ronan's legs started walking. The effect lasted only seconds, but it proved sufficient to urge the wizard on. As his legs returned to his own use, Ronan pressed forward, unwilling to suffer through a second lesson. Deathwing had shown him quite easily how powerful the link between them was. The dragon did not speak again, but Ronan knew that Deathwing lurked somewhere in the recess of his mind. Yet, for all the Black Leviathan's power, he seemed not to have total control over Ronan. At the very least, Ronan's thoughts appeared to be hidden from his, the, his draconic ally's inspection. Otherwise, Deathwing would not have been pleased with the wizard at this very moment, for Ronan already worked to find a way to extricate himself from the dragon's influence. Curious. Last night, he had been more than willing to believe most of what Deathwing had told him, even the part concerning the Black's desire to rescue Alexstrasza. Now, however, a sense of reality had set in. Surely, of all creatures, Deathwing's least desired to see his greatest rival free. He had not sought the destruction of her kind throughout the war. Had he not sought the destruction of her kind throughout the war? Yet he recalled also that Deathwing had answered that question too, very late in their conversation. The children of Alexstrasza have been raised by the orcs human. They have been turned against all other creatures. Her freedom would not change what they have become. They would still serve their masters. I slay them because there is no other choice, you understand? And Roden had understood at that time. Everything the dragon had told him the night before had rung so true. But in the light of the day, the wizard now questioned the depths of those truths. Deathwing might have meant all he said. Yet that did not mean that he did not have another, darker reason for what he did. Ronan contemplating removing the medallion and simply throwing it away. However, to do so would certainly draw his unwanted ally's attention, and it would be so simple for Deathwing to locate him. The dragon had already proven just how swift he could be. Ronan also doubted that if Deathwing had to come... had to come for him again, the armored behemoth would do so as comrade. For now, all he could do was continue along the selected path. It occurred to Ronan that he carried no supplies, not even a water sack. Those items now in the sea along with the hapless. Malik and their griffin. Deathwing had not even seen fit to provide him with anything. The food and drink the dragon had given him last night, apparently all the substance the wizard would receive. Unperturbed, Ronan pushed on. Deathwing wanted him to reach the mountain, and with this, the mage agreed. Somehow, Ronan would make it there. As he climbed along the ever more treacherous terrain, his thoughts could not help to, but to return to Verisa. The elf had shown a tenacious dedication to her duty, but surely now she had turned back, providing that she, too, had survived the attack. The notion that the ranger might not have survived formed a sudden lump in Ronan's throat and caused him to stumble. No, surely she had survived and common sense had dictated that she turn, return to Lordaeron of her own kind. Surely so. Ronan paused, suddenly filled with the urge to turn around. He had the great suspicion that Verisa had not followed common sense, 
but rather had instead insisted on going on, possibly even convincing the unconvincible Falsad into flying her toward Grimbatal. Even now, assuming nothing else had befallen her, Frieza might well be on his trail, slowing, slowly closing in on him. The wizard took a step toward the west. Human? Ronan bit back a curse on Deathwing's voice filled his head. How had the dragon known so quickly? Could he read the mage's thoughts after all? Human. It is time you refreshed yourself and ate. What? What do you mean? You paused. You were looking for water and food, were you not? Yes. No sense of telling the dragon the truth. You are but a short distance from such. Turn east again and journey a few minutes more. I will guide you. His opportunity lost, Ronan obeyed. Summing along the jagged path, he gradually came to a small patch of trees in the middle of nowhere. Amazing how even the worst stretches of Cosmodon life thrust forth. For the shade alone, Ronan actually gave thanks to his undesired ally. In this center of the corpse, you will find what you desire. Natali, not all he desired, although the wizard could not tell Deathwing that. Nonetheless, he moved with some eagerness. More and more, food and water appealed to him. A few minutes rest would certainly help too. The trees were short for their kind, only 12 feet in height, but they offered good shade. Ronan entered the copse. The copse, not corpse. The copse, and immediately looked around. Surely there had to be a brook here and possibly some fruit. What other repast could Deathwing offer from a distance? A feast, apparently. There, in the very center of the wooded area, sat a small display of food and drink, such as Ronan could not have imagined finding. Roasted rabbit, fresh bread, cut fruit, and he touched the flask with some all. Chilled water. Eat, murmured the voice of the dragon. Ronan obeyed with gusto, digging into the meal. The rabbit had been freshly cooked and seasoned to perfection. The bread retained the pleasant scent of the oven. Forgoing manners, he drank directly from the flask and discovered that although the container should have been half empty after that, it remained full. Thereafter, Ronan drank his fill without concern, knowing that Deathwing wanted him well, if only until the wizard reached the mountain. With his magic, he could have conjured something of his own, but that would have drawn strength from him that he might need for more drastic times. In addition, Ronan doubted that he could have created such a repast, at least not without much effort. Sooner than he hoped, Deathwing's voice came again. You are satisfied? Yes. Yes, I am. Thank you. It is time to move on. You know the way. Ronan did know the way. In fact, he could picture the entire route the dragon had shown him. Deathwing had apparently wanted to make certain that his pawn did not wander off the wrong direction. With no other choice, the wizard obeyed. He paused only long enough to take one more glance behind him, hoping against hope. Hopping against hope that he might see the familiar silver hair even from a distance, and yet also wanting neither Verisa nor even Falstad to follow him. Duncan and Mollock had already perished because of his quest. Too many deaths weighed now on Ronan's shoulders. The day aged. With the sun having descended nearly to the horizon, Ronan began questioning Deathwing's path. Not once had he seen, much less confronted, an orc sentry. And surely Grimbatal still had those. In fact, he had not even seen a single dragon. 
Either they no longer patrolled the skies here, or the wizard had wandered so far afield that he had gone outside their range. The sun sank lower. Even a second meal, apparently magic into being by Deathwing, did not assuage Ronan. As the la last light of day disappeared, he paused and tried to make out the landscape ahead. So far, the only mountains he could see stood much too far away in the distance. It would take him several days just to reach them, much less the peak where the orcs kept the dragon. Well, Deathwing had brought him to this point. Deathwing could explain now how he brought how he thought the human could possibly reach his destination. Clutching the medallion, Ronan, his eyes still on the distant mountains, spoke to the empty air. I need to talk with you. Speak. He had not entirely expected the method to work. So far, it had always been the dragon who had contacted him, not the other way around. You said this path would take me to the mountain, but if so, it'll take far longer than I have time. I don't know how you expect me to reach the peak so quickly on foot. As I said earlier, you are not meant to travel the entire way so by so primitive a method. The vision, the vision I sent of the path was what you would ever remain secure in knowledge that you had not become lost. Then how am I supposed to reach it? Patience. They should be with you soon. They? Remain where you are. That would be best. But Ronan realized that Deathwing no longer spoke to him. The wizard once again contemplating tearing the medallion from his throat and tossing it along the rocks. But where would that leave him? Ronan still had to get to the orc's domain. Who did Deathwing mean? And then he heard the sound, a sound of no other he had enc ever encountered. His initial thought was that it might be a dragon, but if so, a dragon with a terrible cause of indigestion. Ronan gazed into the darkening sky, initially seeing nothing. A brief flash of light caught his attention, a flash of light from above. Ronan swore, thinking that Deathwing had sent, set him up to be captured by the orcs. Surely the light had been some sort of torch or crystal in the hand of the dragon rider. The wizard summoned up a spell. He would not go without a fight, however futile it might prove. Then the, flight, then the light flashed again, this time longer. Ronan briefly found himself illuminated, a perfect target for whatever bleaching monster lurked in the darkness. I told you he was here. I knew it all the time. I just wanted to see if you really did. Liar. I knew, and you didn't. I knew, and you didn't. The frown formed on the young spellcaster lips. What sort of dragon argued with itself in such itself in such inane, high pitched tones? Watch that lamp cursed one of the voices. The light suddenly flipped away from Ronan and darted up. The beam briefly shone on a huge oval form, a point at the front, before flickering on the rear, when the wizard made out a smoking, bleaching device that turned a propeller at the end of the oval. A balloon, Ronan realized. A zeppelin. He had actually seen one of those remarkable creations before during the height of the war. Astonishing gas-filled sacks so massive in the sky that they could actually lift an open carriage containing two or three riders. In the war, they had been utilized for observation enemy forces on both land and sea. Yet what amazed Ronan most about them had not been their existence, but they had been powered by resources other than magic, by oil and water. A machine neither built by nor requiring spells drove a balloon, a remarkable device that turned the propeller without the aid of a manpower. The light returned to him, this time fixing on Ronan with what seemed determination. The riders in the flying balloon had him in sight now, and clearly had no intentions of losing him. 
Only then did the fascinated mage recall exactly what race had proven both the ingenuity, 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 ingenuity and touch of madness necessary to dream of such a concept. Goblins. And goblins serve the horde. He darted toward the largest rock, hoping to lose himself lo long enough to at least come up with a spell appropriate for flying balloons. And then a familiar voice echoed in his head, Stay. I can't. There are goblins above me. I've been spotted by their airship. airship. They'll summon the orcs. You will not move. Ronan's feet refused to obey him any longer. Instead, they turned him back to face the unnerving balloon and its even more unnerving pilots. The zeppelin descended to a point just above the hapless wizard's head. A rope ladder dropped over the side of the observation carriage, barely missing Ronan. Your transport has arrived, Deathwing informed him. In scene. That is chapter 11.